happening in the now um, to knowing that it's something that happened in the past. And when I speak to clients, I sort of say to them, when we, when we go through EMDR, we're not trying to erase the memory, we're trying to file it away. So it you know, often will be something that they'll look back on and it's probably not a nice experience if it's trauma related, for example. They're probably not gonna be really happy that it happened, but really what we're working on is reducing the level of distress or hyperarousal. So they can get more of a helicopter view and they can view the incident as something that happened in the past, but they're able to manage their emotions and regulate themselves in the now. And the reprocessing element so once you resource, you then go into the reprocessing. That will go much faster when the client is feeling more stable or secure. And um, when I say stable, I mean that they're more able to regulate their own emotions. So if their emotions are going a bit like this, they know how to come back to their equilibrium because they've got the resources to do that. And in that way, they can start to tolerate higher levels of distress as well. And EMDR is, is very precise. So you're working with specific memories of an event or a distressing event, and you work with one aspect or one trigger at a time. And what you're doing is you're putting fragments of the memory together, and this changes the memory. So it's almost like a filing cabinet that's open and the memories on in order. And when you reprocess, what you're trying to do is file the memories away, look at the ones that you need and, and get rid of the ones that you don't need. Um, and you're also helping them through this to create new neural pathways. So if we think about neuroplasticity, through the reprocessing of the memories, they get new neural pathways as well. So we can think about EMDR in, in two parts. First of all, we're weakening the trauma, and then we're strengthening the coping or the resourcing. And you know, even if we do the first part or the second part of them in combination, it can make a real difference to, to clients. But one thing that really surprised me, I mean, I'll be totally honest, when I first um, trained up in EMDR, I was a little bit skeptical. I wasn't quite sure how I'd feel about it. Um, I wasn't quite sure if it's something that I would use in my practice, but um, having kind of utilized it, I do feel that it's, it's something which is, can have a really positive effect. So I'm definitely less, uh, less skeptical. Um, and yeah, so I will talk about resourcing and I'll sort of explain that a little bit more. Uh, but essentially the resourcing is the strategies or the coping mechanisms that we, uh, we support clients with so that they can then regulate their emotions. So if they're able to regulate their emotions, they're then able to go into the distressing events without it feeling like it's happening in the now. So I'll, I'll go through a lot of techniques with you today that you can utilize. Um, so you can think about it as like grounding techniques or uh, relaxation techniques or anxiety reduction techniques. So some of the things you might already do in your practice, and then I'll just add in a few more tools which you might not be familiar with, which you can then employ with clients, whether you use EMDR or not. Um, and at the essence really is a sense of unconditional positive regard. So I didn't necessarily put EMDR and the kind of relational element together, um, but that was something that was really positive in, in kind of how I then internalized the way I use EMDR with clients. So just like most other therapies, the relationship is completely key. So you've got to be thinking about, you know, how is this person dysregulated and what might support them in being able to ground themselves. So similar to other approaches like CBT, for example, you might have to experiment a little bit with a client and go through various resourcing techniques so that they can find the one that could work for them in different situations. Okay. So um, EMDR stands for Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing. Um, if you probably Google this or look at YouTube, you'll find people doing this. Um, so traditionally it was sort of the eye movement, but there's now a couple of ways, a couple of other ways that you can also use EMDR and that's via tapping. So it's not uh, EFT, but different ways of tapping and I'll go through that with you. And that can be seen as a resource as well because that works with uh, their uh, sympathetic system to kind of regulate their emotions. And what we're really trying to do is think about how we accelerate how we process either traumatic or frozen or stuck memories 
So what it's doing is it's helping um, the individuals to create new neural links. So um, what's, what I found interesting in private practice is often when people are talking to you about a frozen or stuck memory, there's parts that they can't remember. So it's almost like gaps in the memory. And that's because when uh, individuals experience a traumatic experience, the logic goes off and they're in their instinct. So there's less of that kind of frontal lobe and the cognitions that are going on. Um, so when you actually do EMDR with a lot of people, you'll find that parts of the story come back to them because you're not only just going into the instinct part, but you're turning the logic on at the same time. So often they can remember things that perhaps they didn't remember uh, at the time, or they get new insights or new perspectives on that. So you're really trying to change the underlying way that they think about um, the, the actual memory. And you very much take this at the client's pace. So you, it's a very heavily focused on the process. So you don't go into the reprocessing bit until the client feels safe to do so. So you very much sort of follow their lead in that respect. So one of the key things about EMDR is it uses a process called bilateral stimulation. So I describe this as both parts of the brain talking to each other. So you're building that connection. But essentially, as it says here, it's the right and the left hemispheres of the brain that are connecting. And when you do that, what you're doing is you're regulating their nervous system. So they essentially are moving from a state of feeling more tense to a state of feeling more relaxed. Um, and as I said at the beginning, when people can't access actual images or memories, you work with the body. So just like you might do in other forms of therapy, you know, where do you feel that in the body? What shape would it be? How does it feel? Does it feel hot? Uh, are there other sensations in the body? And sometimes you can go through a whole reprocessing session where there's no actual memory, but you're work working on the felt sense within the body and how that changes. And um, with bilateral stimulation, because you're getting both parts of the brain to talk to each other, um, so if you think about walking or running, it's a similar thing. What this does is it introduces a relaxation stimulus to the right brain's way of making sense of the world, so the logical side. Um, and it's getting both parts, the logic and the creative element to sort of talk to each other. So the emotional brain and the cognitive brain start talking to each other. And this creates a rhythm. And this also helps to create a connection and a reconnection between sort of what the past was and the present. So what you're doing through bilateral stimulation is you're transforming a fragmented memory. So bits that the, the kind of emotional brain remembers and maybe bits that the logical brain remembers, you're, you're kind of connecting the two. So what then essentially happens is an individual can look back at a traumatic event, perhaps become more desensitized to it and know that it's not happening in the here and now. So before EMDR, the neural networks between the right and left side of the brain are quite separate. And afterwards, through bilateral stimulation, they connect with each other. So although I can't go into bilateral stimulation with you, I can show you a technique that uses bilateral stimulation that can at least help clients to regulate their emotions. So if they're overwhelmed or if they're, if they're in fight or flight, um, it can help to kind of regulate that so they're able to feel more grounded and more relaxed and the state that they're in moves from one which is more tense to one which is more relaxed. If there's any questions, then do put them in the chat. I'll keep a lookout for that as well. So I just thought I would share this with you. Um, and this is, you know, EMDR is also based on this. So it's the Adaptive Information Processing Model by Shapiro. Shapiro is uh, the individual who also created um, EMDR as we know it now. So, um, in this model, it kind of highlights that humans have an information processing system that generally processes numerous elements of an experience in such a way, which means that an adaptive state is reached and that learning is possible. So our memories are stored in interlinked networks, which are organized around the earliest event of that incident. 
and memory is comprised of our thoughts, our ideas, our feelings, and they're all connected with a particular memory. So even when we are looking at EMDR, you know, I often interlink EMDR and CBT, where we'll look at kind of the regulation of the emotions or the feelings, the understanding of the cognitions and the understanding of the behaviours. Um, and what we're trying to do is also change that loop as well. So you can approach you can approach clients from a number of different angles and so when they feel safe to regulate their emotions and perhaps they start to understand some of their thoughts and connected behaviors that is then usually when i'll move into an emdr model which is more about the reprocessing um but if there's a, a missing or incomplete processing of a memory um i suppose the memory is then stored in very distorted ways and so that's why there's that re-experiencing as if it's happening in the now, because it takes us back to that point. And so things like flashbacks or felt sense or anxiety or panic, that is kind of the instinct taking over and taking us back to that same feeling that happened at the time of the traumatic event. Um, and so what we're trying to do is really, as I said, use something like bilateral stimulation to reprocess the memory in a safe way and help that individual to file it away in a way that feels safe for them. So what can you use EMDR for? It's quite a broad range actually, quite a broad range of um, different potential uh, elements. So anxiety, phobias, trauma um, but with trauma you're probably looking at specific events so you would approach each event one at a time uh, grief post-traumatic stress disorder uh, various illnesses and linked in with more pain related illnesses um, addictions as a protocol for addictions also allergies so i've utilized it recently with someone um, to think about hay fever um, because often there's an underlying emotional component to allergies which emdr can support with um, psychosomatic disorders, fear, panic attacks, dissociative disorders, sexual dysfunction, and complex trauma. So as you can see, it's quite a wide range of potential concerns that you might be able to use EMDR for. So it's a similar protocol for each, but with slight variations um, based on what the presenting issue is. Um, it's not usually suitable for, for things such as brain injury or disorders, I think depending upon the level of brain injury, um, and that's probably linked in with the neural pathways, things like epilepsy, self-harm, personality disorder, psychosis, schizophrenia, um, strong secondary gain issues. So even with things like um, hay fever or other protocols, you'd be looking at what is the purpose of having this trauma or what is the purpose of having an allergy, for example. You know, is the client willing to, um, to kind of work through this? And what will the client gain if they let go of this? Um, and what can they replace it with? Um, and then also you wanna be thinking about the ability to cope with physical stress or even emotional stress. So I'd say it's probably not suitable to start the EMDR reprocessing until a client can regulate their emotions because they have to, particularly when you're working in a virtual way, you have to kind of be sure that they're able to bring themselves back to the here and now, or they have enough resources in their bank to be able to ground themselves because it can be a very emotionally draining process. And um, a really interesting thing for me that I've noticed is it's not just a kind of emotionally draining process for some clients, but also um, it can elicit real physical pain. So if it was an accident, for example, that client might experience the same symptoms that they did at the time of the incident. Um, so, you know, you probably have heard the, the comment that our body can hold on to trauma. And it's quite interesting to see that in the room and, and kind of the trauma shifting throughout the body as well as the emotions. Um, so I think it's about ensuring that the client is ready enough uh, to be able to go through that process with you. Um, there's a link here and we can sort of share this with people, um, but most of the NICE guidelines do focus on sort of post-traumatic stress and trauma. Um, and uh, I suppose the whole point of showing this slide here is that it's probably much wider than that. But in terms of the research, 
there is a lot of research in relation to uh, post-traumatic stress. And the more complicated the, the stress and the trauma, obviously, the more sessions that you might need, uh, because a lot of that will focus on the resourcing, which we're going to talk about now. Yeah, if there's any questions on, on the kind of that part, then do let me know. But what I would like to do with you now is kind of move into some of the techniques that you might use. And maybe we'll also try a few together. So I know that most of you have got your cameras off and that's fine. Um, but, you know, if you if you feel up for it, then do try them as we go along. Um, but regardless of your orientation in terms of your clinical orientation, these are just really nice techniques to have. In, in your toolkit, I think, and for clients to have in their toolkit to help them to regulate their emotions. So coming back to someone's question earlier, in terms of resourcing, what we're really trying to do is create a safe um, network of tools that clients can use to help them to regulate and ground themselves. So, um, you know, even if their anxiety spikes or they feel overwhelmed or they go to fight or flight, they can then essentially put the lid back on that for themselves. If you have a pen and paper handy, um, that will be really useful for one of the techniques um, that we'll probably go through because it'd be good to sort of try them out and test them out if you can. So just before we go into the resourcing, I can't go into this in lots of detail, but I just wanted to give you an overview of what happens. So after we've resourced and we've prepared with the client, we go into the EMDR treatment or the actual reprocessing bit where we go into the memory. But uh, this is essentially kind of what it looks like. It's an eight phase model. So if you ever see a diagram, it looks like a circle and there's sort of eight phases that you work through. So similar to other types of therapy, first of all, you would take a case history and a treatment planning. Um, and actually what you would probably do is a trauma map because even though you might be focusing on one specific incident, you never know where the memory can go or where the brain can go. So what I've also found quite interesting is sometimes when people are reprocessing a memory, it goes in chronological order. Other times it might jump around. Other times it'll be more images, it's like a, watching a film. Other points, it might be more working with the body. So it's really important to understand sort of that client's experiences, even if you've got quite a specific focus for your EMTR, because you need to be aware of other things that might come up so you can then ground them and deal with one thing at a time. Um, so for example, if I was working with someone who's maybe been through an accident, um, I might be mindful if they've had uh, an experience of sexual abuse in the past and just hold that in mind so we can start to disentangle some of the memories if they do get entangled whilst we're reprocessing. And then you go through the stabilization phase. It's essentially is the preparing for the EMDR. And this also includes some of the resourcing or grounding techniques. Um, and with the preparation for the EMDR, I always tend to work, walk people through what I'm going to ask when we go through the EMDR processing. So they're aware of, you know, what I might ask, even though I can't guarantee what will happen in terms of the memories, there is some element of containment there. Then you'd be thinking about kind of where are they now in terms of trauma, or if you were looking at anxiety or mood, you might be kind of um, considering whether this is an appropriate time uh, for them to engage in the EMDR processing. Uh, you might start to encourage them to think about the event. So similar to CBT, there might be some sort of desensitization there and processing. So you might be encouraging them to work through their fear hierarchy or you know, engage in the grounding techniques regularly. Um, also, I suppose by preparing for the EMDR process, you will be thinking about the incident and talking about the incident. So you're already starting the desensitization process. With traumatic events, usually it's not just the event, but it's the meaning that's attached to the event. So what we tend to do in the EMDR process is really look at what is the cognition behind what's happened here. So if I was in an accident, is the cognition, I'm going to die, I'm not in control, I'm helpless, I'm powerless. What's the real meaning behind that event for them? And then you would look at what do we want to change that to? So for example, if um, the negative cognition was I'm in danger or I'm going to die, perhaps we might flip that to something like I am safe 
or I'm resilient or I'm powerful uh, or I'm able. So you work with the client to really establish what it is that they want to instill. And then we do the reprocessing of the memory until um, it becomes less emotive. And the clients essentially almost get the sense that they're able to talk about the incident without being emotionally triggered. And that might happen over a few sessions. So you might not be able to uh, you know, completely reprocess an event in, in one session and you very much take it at the pace of the client. And often when we're doing the reprocessing sessions, it would be 90 minutes rather than 60 minutes to really allow you that time to lead into it, do some of the reprocessing and then some of the grounding as well. Um, and then at the end, when you're kind of ending the session, you would do a body scan just to see what's going on for that client. You would then think about kind of how you ground them and their safety net and what they might do for the rest of the week, for example, or how they might take care of themselves. And then when you come to the next session, you would review. So you'd think about how distressing that event feels and actually whether you need to continue with the reprocessing or whether that feels like it's enough at that point in time. So roughly that's how the eight phases of treatment sort of go. Um, but obviously I can't go into lots of detail about the protocol just because you'd need to go on a lot of the training for that. Um, but I suppose what we're talking about now is stabilizational element and also a part of the desensitization element, which you can use in, in your practice. So when we think about resourcing, um, you know, this can fit really well with other therapeutic models. So often you will see combinations of CBT and EMDR, mindfulness, uh, trauma-focused CBT, grounding, uh, potentially even like person-centered therapy. So you can integrate this into, into any way, really, if it works for you. But you probably might have some of your own resources that you use. And if there's anything you want to share in the chat, then please do feel free, so, free to do so. Uh, but it can include things like psychoeducation. So I often find with things like trauma or anxiety, just explain, explaining how the brain works and how fight or flight works can be really powerful. Um, often, you know, we are so used to talking about these things and um, so used to just being a normal part of our everyday lives and our work that we forget how powerful understanding things like fight or flight can be for people. Um, and so you might think about psychoeducation, you might think about things like the hot cross bun, for example, in CBT, the links between feeling sorts and behaviours. Uh, you might look at body work if that's something that you already utilise. Um, so if you've got any techniques about that, you might kind of use that as a resourcing technique. But that can include things like a mindful body scan to just check in with how your body feels. Um, progressive muscle relaxation, which can help clients to sort of move states from feeling perhaps more anxious and on edge to feeling calmer and more relaxed. You can help clients to think about their support networks. And often when we're about to go into the EMDR reprocessing sessions, I'll always encourage clients to think about what might they do after the session, who's in their support network, would they want to let anybody know that that might be a bit more of an emotionally heavy session for them. So all of these things you want to kind of think about in advance so clients have that to hand. Uh, you might think about their internal resources and I'm going to go through a technique with you which is a power symbol which can be used as an internal resource um, but that can include also things like a positives list um, or you know thinking about how clients have overcome challenges in the past. Um, it can also include internal strategies or kind of self-care um, so what do they use to ground themselves in the now, for example, artwork or creativity or music? So you want to be thinking about the client quite holistically. You know, what resources do they use? What can they continue to use as well in between sessions? And then maybe thinking about something like um, grounding statements as well. So interestingly enough, when you are doing the EMDR reprocessing, you're changing sort of the negative cognition to more of a positive cognition. And that's where some of the grounding statements might come in as well in terms of the client's resilience or their strengths. So there's lots of work that you can do before you even get to any reprocessing, but all of this is still really important and it's very, very powerful for clients. 
I'm going to go through kind of a few techniques with you, some that you might be more familiar with, others that you might be kind of less familiar with. And this is, I suppose, a bit of a top up in your toolkit um, and something that you can share with your clients as well. So uh, gratitude, you know, when I was training, this was a really seen as a really strong form of resourcing. You know, it's very simple. It's very impactful as well. So you might be thinking about uh, encouraging clients to start preparing for the reprocessing way in advance, which is why I like to start with the grounding techniques and start with things like thought challenging. But one technique you can offer is this daily gratitude. So asking clients to reflect on their positive experiences, maybe three things that went well, three things they're grateful for, or three things they want to accomplish or have accomplished or why they might be successful that day. And to do that for sort of 30 days so they get used to the habit of kind of skewing away from those negative cognitions and the spiraling down that can come along with it. So what we're trying to do here is almost create that balance and that perspective for clients as well. Very simple, very effective. Um, the next one is the power symbol. So if you have um, if you have a piece of paper to hand, I'd encourage you to get that now. Um, but with clients, what I would say is just get an A4 sheet of paper and a pen. And um, I'd essentially ask them at this point in time, if you reflect on your life right now, or if you reflect on a challenging situation right now, um, what do you think you need more of? Or is there a resource you might need more of? Or what might help you in this situation? So a client might say something like confidence. So you might just reflect on challenge for you and think about what you might need more of. If you want to put any of that in the chat, then feel free to do that. And what you're going to ask them to do then is, you know, can you think of a symbol to represent this? And it doesn't have to be logical, it doesn't have to be a logical connection. So I can think of confidence and I can think of a circle, um, or I might think of something else. So whatever initially comes to the client is completely fine. And then what you get them to do is you get them to write what they need, so the name of the resource. So if it was confidence, I'd write that at the top of the page and I'd write that with my non-dominant hand. And then what you would ask them to do is draw the symbol with their non-dominant hand as well. And what you're trying to get them to do is connect the feeling. So at this point, they've got the symbol, they've got the resource, and I'd encourage them then to put the symbol on the floor, so the bit of paper on the floor. And what I'd ask them to do is to step onto that bit of paper and just see what it would feel like to embody more of that symbol. And I then encourage them to tap in that feeling. And that's a form of bilateral stimulation that I'll go through with you in a, in a little bit. But essentially you're trying to get them to step into what it feels like to be more confident or to have more of that resource. Um, and I've had people use this as a grounding technique and sometimes people might reflect on different symbols that they could need. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be for trauma. If it's something like confidence and they're about to do a presentation, they might choose a symbol and then they can have that as, as a reminder. So if it was something like a circle, they might have a post-it note with a circle on it, which reminds them to step into their power. Uh, but also as they step onto that power symbol, they can embody that. So what does it feel like? What would they be thinking? You can often see that people's posture changes. So they stand straighter, they stand taller. And obviously, as we know, our nonverbal behavior is, is really important in terms of creating a change for us as well. So I'd encourage you to sort of try this out for yourself. If you're feeling like you could do with a power symbol, what would that look like? How would that feel? Run through it, step onto your power symbol, embody it and see how that feels. So you're really tapping to anchor the feeling into your body. Um, and I'm going to go on to tapping now. But tapping is that form of bilateral stimulation. So remember, bilateral stimulation is about getting both parts of the brain talking to each other, getting connected. And tapping is really good for when we feel overwhelmed. So perhaps when we can't do some of the traditional grounding techniques like breathing techniques and we just need a bit of a quick fix. Tapping can be really useful for that. 
And there's a few ways that we can do that. So we also do use tapping as part of the EMDR reprocessing procedure as well. So although you can use sort of eye movements, you can also use tapping as a way to reprocess memories too. Um, and clients can either tap on themselves or if you are in the same room and it's safe to do so, you can also tap on them. Um, so there's a few ways that you can use it. Um, but, you know, in terms of tapping, there are a few, few ways. Um, the first way is butterfly tapping. Once again, I'll encourage you to try this and you can try this with your cameras off. It's completely fine uh, because you also want to encourage clients to be able to do this so they can then figure out the best method for themselves. So with butterfly tapping, what you do is you cross your arms you find a position on your arms that feels comfortable. So it might be higher up, it might be lower down. And essentially you then start tapping one side and then the other. So you could tap faster or you could tap slower. You find a rhythm and a pace that feels right for you. This works with your sympathetic system or the fight or flight system. And it literally helps to sort of calm that system down. So it's really a good one for children as well. Um, and if you think about walking or you think about running, you know, often why people feel quite relaxed after they walk or they run is because it is bilateral stimulation, so it mirrors this. So this is also a really good technique, maybe if you're in a space where you can't go out for a walk, if that's something you would normally do, um, or you can't go out for a run, if that's something that you would normally do. This is a nice way to sort of stimulate the same response. And if you think about the power symbol, you can also use tapping at the end when you start standing on the power symbol to really anchor the feeling. So it's almost like you're tapping it into yourself. In addition, you could also add in positive statements. So we'll talk about I am statements in a moment, um, but you can use tap tapping to anchor them in as well. So this is quite an obvious way to tap. And some people like this feeling, they find it nurturing, but for others, they find it a little bit suffocating. So that's why it's important to check in with your client to say, you know, how does that feel? As you probably would do that anyway. How does it feel? Is this something that you would use? Because there are alternatives as well. Um, if they don't want to tap, some people like to stroke. So that might be something that you could also suggest as well. Um, but if that's not for them, or if they want to use something which is less obvious, they can also tap on their legs. So if I was sitting here now on a desk, I can be tapping right now, getting the benefits of that bilateral stimulation without anybody knowing what I'm doing. So I like to show people kind of less obvious ways to get the results as well. So when you tap on your legs, what you would do is on your thighs, a couple of inches above your knees, you would just start tapping left and right. So you might tap faster or you might tap slower. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen kind of people trying to regulate themselves either with shaking their legs or sometimes you see that in schools where children are tapping on, um, on the desk. Um, but this is a great way to get similar feeling. So you might want to try that out yourself and see how that feels. And for most people that feels a little bit more grounding, but it's also something that they can do less obviously. So if they're on a Zoom call and they're feeling dysregulated or they're feeling overwhelmed and they can't leave the space at that point in time, they can start to tap and have the benefits of that. In addition, another way that you can get the same effects of the bilateral stimulation is through listening to something called binaural beats. Um, or EMDR music. So you can have a look on, on YouTube and just sort of experiment or encourage clients to, to find something that fits with them. And usually you listen to binaural beats with headphones in. And what it does is it goes louder in one ear and then louder in the other. So you're getting that stimulation and you're getting both parts of the brain talking to each other again. I find that with binaural beats, if people have um, trouble sleeping, that can sometimes be quite a nice thing for them to listen to. But also it's an inconspicuous way to get the benefits um, of bilateral stimulation without it being obvious. So you could listen to that when you were on the tube, for example, and no one would know what you're doing. So I think it's always good to check in with the clients, see which one they like, if they like it. Um, and then that's something that they can use. 
Um, clients can use tapping throughout a session. Yeah, if they have a small window of tolerance, I would definitely say they can. Um, and so they can use it in, in a session, they can use it in a meeting. Um, so yeah, they can use that pretty much anywhere. What I would say though, is if they are finding, if you are finding that they perhaps need to use tapping, especially if they're tapping on their legs, you might not know. Um, that they are tapping. So it's probably useful for you to negotiate some sort of sign with the client. So for example, if we're doing some resourcing or we're going into talking about something which could be potentially overwhelming, I'd encourage clients to give me a stop sign or give me a sign that they might need a pause or perhaps they could give you a sign that they might need to tap. So you can just kind of check in with them um, just so you're aware that they are tapping and you can then navigate how much you, you kind of go into information at that point in time. But it's definitely something that can be used and often it is used even when we start the reprocessing. So, you know, if it becomes too overwhelming, we might use other techniques just to reground the client in the now. So it's definitely something they can use to build their window of tolerance. And then you've got the mastery or the I am statements. So if we go back to the tapping, you can tap these statements in, but you also don't have to. You can use them almost like an affirmation. Um, with affirmations, I would say that the key to affirmations is the connection to the feeling. So unless the client really feels that way, it can be a challenge to sort of change the cognition. But if they tap the affirmation in, that can sometimes help in terms of embedding the affirmation. So what you do with this is, once again, you're encouraging clients to reflect on their resilience and kind of reflect on what they already have within them. Um, and this can also be good for building their, their tolerance in terms of what they think they can handle and can process. So you might encourage them to think about a time they've overcome a challenge. And it could be something that you set for the week. So a goal that you set, particularly if you're working through something like a fear hierarchy, you know, what have they kind of worked through that week? How have they managed? It's not about the absence of challenges, it's about how they manage it and then get them to kind of reflect in depth. So what does that say about you? You know, what are your strengths? What are your positives? What are your motivations? Um, and if you can try and change those things into an I am statement or I can statement or I do statement. And those are statements that clients can use to tap in throughout the week. So in between sessions, it can be quite a nice resource as well. And as they start to accomplish more things, what then can then happen is that they can start to build this repertoire of I am statements. Um, so, you know, actually they back it up with evidence because they're, start, they're going through new challenges. So if you are using something like CBT, where you're setting goals, reflect on this. What has this said about you? How can you add that to your list of I am or mastery statements? and the tapping in of that can be really useful. So you could also, if you want to, combine some of these techniques. But if you get to an I am statement, you could even sort of create that, a power symbol around that. So if you are resilient and that's your power symbol, what would that mean? And what would you then tap in? So you can kind of help clients to get creative with that too. <clears throat> then perhaps another technique that you, might use or have heard of is the safe space visualization um, and you know this can be really powerful some clients really love visualization others not so much but I think it's always worth giving people the option because sometimes they feel like they're not going to be able to visualize but when they do this they can connect with it um, so with a safe space visualization you'd ask the client if it's safe to do so for them to close their eyes you'd ask them to think about you know, first of all, you'd ask them to check in with their body and take a couple of breaths in and out. Um, and then you'd ask them to reflect on a place where they feel calm, they feel relaxed, they feel safe. Um, so it might be somewhere they've been to before or it might be a place that they can imagine, but somewhere outside of the home. Um, and I always ask people in the visualization to look down at their feet first because I feel that anchors them into their visualization. And then you just gently encourage them to explore what they can see around them with all of their senses. So 
colors, the shapes, perhaps the temperature, um, if they can hear any sounds or taste anything or smell anything and really get them to sort of embed into their visualization until they start to feel calmer and more relaxed. And I always explain to, to people that the great thing about visualization is if you can really connect to it with your senses and with feeling, your, your brain actually can't tell the difference between something happening in your visualization versus it happening in the now. So it's quite a powerful tool. Um, most people that I tend to work with will probably use a visualization maybe at night time. So if they are in a safe place already, if their home is safe for them, um, or if they're struggling to go to bed, I might suggest they do something like a visualization with the tapping, because that can help as well. Um, and you know, for some people, this may not feel safe. So, you know, they might not feel able to close their eyes. They can either look at something in, on the floor, maybe kind of a point on the floor, which feels safer. So I wouldn't push this unless the client feels ready to engage in a visualization. And perhaps if they're not ready at the beginning, it might be something that you come back to, and that might be an indicator that something has shifted for them as well, which can be a really nice validation of their progress too. So an EMDR technique that I like is, is the vault. Um, and this can be really good for flashbacks or intrusive memories as well. Um, once again, it is a visualization technique, but essentially what you're doing is you're creating a container for distressing materials. So if I was to kind of run through this with the client, you know, I'd ask them once again to close their eyes, if that's safe to do so. And I'd you know, say something along the lines of, imagine that there's a container or a vault in front of you. It can be any shape, it can be any size. So I'd really encourage them to look at the container or the vault, to have a look around, just to think about the size, think about the color, think about the material, maybe think about the location, the shape. So really get them connected to this. Um, and then you would kind of say to them that if there's anything they'd want to put in the vault, they can. Um, so it might be an emotion, it might be a memory, it might be a thought. And then what you'd ask them to do is put whatever they want to put into the vault and you ask them to see the door shut. So for some people, it's almost like a little safe. Um, for others, it might be some, something similar to a big bank vault, which they then kind of shut the door and you'd ask them to see the, the, the door lock. So whether it's a digital lock or a lock that they actually move. Um, and then you would say to them that this is kind of your vault and you decide what happens when the door is shut. So either it disappears or you can come back to it whenever you're ready, but they're in charge of how the vault opens and when it opens. So you're creating that safety for them. Um, and they can decide what then happens. And so the vault can be, you know, I've used it quite successfully with people who do have intrusive memories. If they feel like they can't sit with the intrusive thoughts, they can put that in their vault until they're ready. Um, so that can help. And even with flashbacks, sometimes the vault can be an interesting technique. Um, but once again, I think you'd probably need to work with the client just to see if visualization is something that they naturally connect with too. So for me, EMDR is kind of probably much more creative than I originally thought. So that's probably some of my biases in terms of it. And as you can see, there's lots that goes into sort of the preparation process more than just the reprocessing of the memory. The reprocessing of the memory is quite a small part. It's more the safety and the tools and the resources and the regulation that's very essential. And, it's, and you know, clients can use that in other parts of their life as well. Um, so they're kind of life schools that we're embedding clients with. And lastly, um, there's another technique called the EMDR light stream. And this can be quite useful when your clients are perhaps having upsetting bodily sensations as well. So what you would do is you'd ask them to focus um, or concentrate on how their body feels and maybe the sensations that they are feeling at that point in time. So this might be sort of towards the end of the session, or if you need to kind of take a pause moment, this might be something to think about. And then once again, you wanna ask a few probing questions. So if this um, sensation had a shape, what would that be? If it had a size, what would that be? If it had a color, what would that be? So it's really the externalization of the sensation. If it had a temperature, what would that feel like? 
Um, you know, you might also be thinking about textures or sounds. And then, you know, you can ask them to imagine some sort of healing light and you might adapt the language depending on the client. So either a healing light, a cleansing light or a light or an EMDR light. So you might kind of negotiate that a little bit and imagine that coming through the top of your head and it's directing itself at this object, at this externalized object. Um, and then you can almost see that object being immersed by this EMDR light stream. And what you can imagine is that this EMDR light stream is a different color. And that color is the color which is then embedding the original distressing sensation. Um, and you can ask them again to tune into this EMDR light stream to decide whether it's cool or it's hot and how that feels for them. Um, and it's directing itself to, to the shape. And that's a way to kind of help them to regulate some of the physical sensations. But tapping as well can be a really great way to shift some of those physical sensations. It's a bit of a whistle-stop tour, but I mean, hopefully some of these resourcing techniques can be useful. Um, and I think it's so important, you know, sometimes even in my practice, I never get to the reprocessing, but there's still work that is done and it's still kind of EMDR related work. And I think it's just to really show that it can be much broader than we originally think. So there are um, you know, some further reading here, if, if that's something you'd like to look into. Um, and you know, if you've got any techniques that you use in terms of resourcing, then obviously feel free to share that as well. Um, but it, yeah, if you want to kind of look up more, of, more about EMDR, then this might be a great place to start as well. And uh, if you want to connect with me, here's some of my information. Uh, but I suppose what we'll do now is we'll kind of open it up in case there are any questions. I'll just stop sharing my screen. So I've answered some as, as we've gone along. Um, but if anyone has any questions or reflections, then yeah, it'd be great to sort of hear from you. I've got about five minutes. Thanks very much for that, Rena. That was really great. 